Hello, I'm Malak Fuad, and welcome to the season finale of What I Did Next from ANT Media. This show focuses on people's personal and professional crossroads and looks at those moments from key pivot points. My guests are multilingual, multicultural, and they are either from the Middle East or are connected to the region in some way. My guests come from different industries, but the one common thread is that they are curious and passionate about the world around them, and they hope to leave their mark in some way. I'm delighted today to have Yusuf Idib as my guest. Filmmaker, photographer, writer, ad man, broadcaster, foodie, and even sailor. These are just some of the many labels we can use to describe this polymath of a man. A son of Alexandria, Yusuf's life has seen him move from Egypt to Canada to Kuwait and finally to Dubai, where he currently resides. Yusuf started out in films, first in Canada, then moving to advertising in the Middle East in the 80s and the 90s. In 2002, he then moved on to broadcasting with the Middle East Broadcasting Center Group, MBC, as head of production and programming. After that, with Tekhayel Entertainment that he founded in 2006, Yusuf launched the food channel Fatafit, a venture he calls his baby. He created the Fatafit catchphrase Al Haya Halwa. The origin of this phrase is very close to his heart, but can also be seen as the guiding words of his life. Yusuf unpacks the peaks and troughs of his journey in our conversation, and we discuss the pivots that have shaped his path. My sense of Yusuf is of someone who is very deliberate, thoughtful and calm, a person who takes a 360 view of things before acting. He's also a person who still has a lot of questions, and he doesn't hesitate to find the path that will lead to the answers. We start our discussion today with our icebreaker questions. The first question is based on the Malcolm Gladwell book, The Tipping Point. I asked Yusuf what personality type from the book he most associates with, a connector, a salesman, or a maven. Well, I give it a lot of thought. And I didn't find myself, as we have talked, in one particular one of these. And I don't think any of us fit, you know, this cookie cutter definition. Uh, I found myself in one, I don't know where it would fit, but in two things. Mm -hmm. One, as a creator. Mm -hmm. So I find myself creating, Mm -hmm. whether it's creating TV commercials, creating TV channel brands, TV shows, films, etc., writing, painting. But a bigger one that most people wouldn't know about is that I find myself as a facilitator or a catalyst for a lot of people's careers. If there's one talent I am sure I have, it's not creativity. Creativity comes and goes. But I have this talent, this gift, where I can see talent in others, Mm. hidden talent like a diamond in a rough. And over and over, time and time again in my life, I've taken people who didn't even see it in themselves and sort of like an arrow threw them into their future Mm -hmm. and and made them shine. So I don't know where that fits. It seems to me it would be a combination of connector and salesman because you're you're putting people together, you're helping them on the stepping stone of their career, Mm -hmm. Uh, but also you're perhaps if someone has a talent but are not sure of it, then you can persuade them into believing that they should go that route. So that could be made perhaps a salesman. Yeah, but you should see me do it, like (laughs) with whips. Oh, really? You're very... It's like, you know, the expression dragging someone to heaven with chains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To heaven. Yeah. To their heaven. Yes. But you're dragging them with chains because it takes hard work. Yeah. It takes self-discipline. And why is that? Is it because the people don't want to go, don't want to move forward, or they're scared? Or what? what is the reason for that? I, I think it's the difference between dreaming about something and doing mm-hmm. something. And and maybe they know they wish to be in that place and of success, but they want to take their sweet time mm-hmm. doing it, which means they may never get there. And I see it as like, do it now, now. Just do this, do it now, do it tomorrow morning. And... Um, and eventually, years later, they'll call me back and say, it was awful working with you. But it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And why, in your mind, does it have to be done so quickly? It's not a, like an urgency, like time urgency, but in the sense of achieving yourself, self-realization, uh, being your best. Uh, life is short. You know, there's competition mm-hmm. out Absolutely. there. There's someone younger, prettier, uh, has more connections than you, so you better move on. Because if you take your time, it may never happen. Because I took my time. Yeah. And someone did that to me, Mm. you know. And had that person not done that to me, pushed me along, I may not have. So we haven't determined which of these you are. (laughs) You're a combination. 
or you're um, a fourth category. I think we are. We all are. Yeah. Are, yeah. Are combinations. I'm always fascinated to see how people see themselves, um, and I find that sometimes people underestimate where their strong traits are. You know. Mm, mm. So it's interesting. Well, I I I thought about this question yeah. that you're going to ask me, and I thought to myself. I realized about myself, or I remembered something about myself, that I'm always erasing yesterday. Right. In other words, if I have a success, I don't think about it, like it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then others remind me that I have a success. Why do you do that? I think I'm afraid of my ego. Right. You know, I'm afraid of being satisfied. I'm afraid of uh, getting carried away with myself, mm -hmm. believing that success is a given. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Or that you're in, or is it that you feel you're worried you're entitled to it? I'm worried of taking it for granted. I'm worried of not striving for more. I know that everything goes away, so I don't want to be comfortable in success mm -hmm. because it, you know. So there's an insecurity there. Uh, that hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. But that's what spurs Total you on. But that spurs yeah. you on, I guess. It's that's also, your driving force. Yeah, and it's also early on in life because of certain. Teachers I had at, at art school, you know, fine arts or film school, who t who told us this thing. I don't know if I agree with it now, but خلاص يعني they ingrained it in mm -hmm. us. And no, don't ever say you're an artist. Why? The minute you say you're an artist, you're dead as an artist. You know that that by definition, mm. I am an artist. Yeah. Of the things that I do. Yeah. I cannot utter the word. It's like sacrilegious, and I blame my teachers for putting me in that place. But I find it interesting that your teachers. Um, were anti the artist label. I think today it's quite different. I think everyone and his mother considers themselves an artist. Yeah. It's it's become very sort of um, uh, what's the word trendy. Is that because of the facility of social media? And I think so. Facility be... of creating. I the school I went to for fine arts in the University of Victoria on the extreme west coast of Canada was a very rebellious school. Art school, rebellious, and even though the teachers were artists in themselves, they were telling us, "Don't call yourself an artist." So, so that's that's where that comes from, I think. What period is this? The seventies, right? Mid to late seventies, mm. yeah. Let's go back sure. to our second icebreaker question, which is um, about social media. So, within what we're talking about, are you team Twitter or are you team Instagram, or do you look at them equally, indifferently? How do you approach it? Uh, definitely Instagram, because it's a visual medium, and that's where I come from—a visual medium. And it's—it's um, it's not like Twitter is like a news bulletin. I feel like mm -hmm. I go on Twitter sometimes, yeah. rarely. Yeah. But I feel Twitter—you have to be there, you have to respond right away. It's like things are happening, and it's good when there's news. But it's not my—it's not in my bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. say. What are the accounts that you like there? If you had to pick five. So here's the the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I follow a lot of abstract painters. Okay, interesting. Because I like to paint as a hobby. Ken Goshen is one, one word, Ken Goshen, the young New Yorker, and he's showing techniques all the time, mm. techniques, techniques. Like yesterday, he was saying, a good exercise is to draw or paint something with 15 strokes. Like you get to put the pen down mm -hmm, 15 mm -hmm, times mm -hmm. and finish. And then I, Thich Nhat Han, I don't know how to pronounce his name, this Buddhist monk who died last month. You've heard of him? No, I haven't. Okay, he's the father of mindfulness. Oh, I see. Yeah. And he he writes things like the following. Four words. Watch this. No mud, no lotus. Okay? So okay. When, when you digest that, what he just said, no yeah. mud, no lotus, yeah. means no shit, no flower. <laughs> so it's about life. Yeah. Life is a combination of that. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah. So you're going through a grinding stone for the oil or the cognac to come out. So these kind of things help me. How do you use something like that in your everyday life? I remember it when I'm in the mud. And I remember it when I'm in the lotus. Right. That it passes, you know, and it's just about day and night. Mm. So life mm. is like that. It's cycles. Um, I like this Lebanese podcast, Sardi. Do mm -hmm. you listen to it? No. Sardi after dinner? No. Oh. oh, really? Oh, it's a podcast. But they put clips on Instagram yes. with video. And it's Lebanese current affairs. Wow. And it's like an hour long. Huh. And I love that they can be so free. At in English they... or in Arabic? 
combination English, French, Arabic. I see. Saturday, I guess, in Lebanese means chit chat. Right, right, right. Interesting. I'll that's, look that up. That's really good. And I follow It must a, be a very depressing thing to listen to these days, though. Lebanon it's funny sometimes. Yeah, but they're in, funny. Oh, they're funny. They're really funny. Oh, wow. Interesting. They're so open. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I follow Nowness. Um, it's Nowness. Funny enough, yesterday they had an Egyptian filmmaker, and it's an international website that highlights creativity outside of the box. Hmm. Interesting. But just and it jolts you. When I see it, I follow them because it just refreshes my head. Let's uh, go now into a little bit of your actual life journey, and let's start at the beginning. Um, I know that you've had a Uh, your, your your childhood was comprised of maybe two phases. You have the phase in Egypt, and then when you were, um, I believe, 13? 12. 12, you moved to Canada. I'm the youngest of five. The the, the difference between me and my the elder, the, the, the number one and number five, is six years. So basically for, for, um, for five years, my mother was a baby factory, and they divorced, my parents divorced, Um, not pleasantly, when I was, I'm told, when I was a year old. Um, so we ended up living, and it's, I won't go into the details. I can, I just don't want to make it very long. I can, I, I'm not hiding anything. But somehow the agreement, the best agreement they could reach was that we would live with neither of them. Mm -hmm. We live with my grandmother from my father's side in Alexandria. My mother remained in Cairo. And... My father went to work in Gaza mm -hmm. with the United Nations. And this is, we're talking, uh, the what period? Even late 50s, because that's when, I, you know, I was born in 54. That would have been around 56. So we're talking the the height of the Abdel Nasser mania. Yeah, yeah, that right? ugly period. Yeah, not a good time. No. And uh, we, my mother would come and visit once every month or two for three, four hours. You know, she would come on the morning train, mm. see us flood us with love and attention and disappear. She had to go back. That's very traumatic for you as a child. Extremely. I mean, of course. Yeah. And my father would come from Gaza and visit us for a couple of days every month or two mm. and bring the chocolates and, you know, the Cadbury chocolate, remember those days, and toys, etc., and then disappear. Meanwhile, it was winter. Mm. Literally, mm, mm, mm. you know, like it was the weather was winter and internally it was winter. And dark times. It was cold. And And was your grandmother a person of, uh, did she provide comfort? Was she? Uh, no. She was not a, a no. warm person. None of them were. I see. Uh, we, we, you know, we were the, the tainted, untouchable kids, you know, by her. El Marhoma, they mm. called her, mm. the deceased mm. one. Mm. It was horrible. Thank God it was my life. I'm 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 glad hmm. that was my journey, and, hmm. and it's I have no it regrets. You. It formed it's you. It's who in, I am. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it meant that we, I, you know, when, when I say I grew up in Alexandria, people say, "Oh, what beaches did you go to? Or where did you?" I didn't swim in Alexandria once, hmm. because the minute school ended, we went to Gaza for the summer, and it was wonderful there. The best beach for me, every beach I go to is me trying to remember my beach in Gaza. And we forget, of course, that at the time. Uh, Palestine, Gaza, Egypt, it was all fluid. Borders didn't really matter. No, 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 not true. No, it wasn't like that? No, 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 no. We're at uh, war. Yeah. But, but, but Gaza was managed by Egypt, and therefore the United Nations were there. Mm -hmm. We would go there in the summer, and every night there was a civilian club where there was, you know, Life magazine, beer, mm -hmm. Brazilian bands, mm -hmm. you know, United Nations, mm -hmm. movies and outdoor being played, you know, lemon trees, orange trees, grapefruit trees, um, Palestine. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was fun. And then we would spend like a week with my mother in Cairo mm -hmm. and her husband. She had remarried. She remarried a few years later. Did she have more children? I have oh. two younger siblings, I yeah. See. And therefore it was this, like the tide. Mm. It would be like months of dryness and very cold and no emotions and no one paying attention to a few hours of just, you know, being flooded with your mother, flooded. Did that make you and your siblings very close? Did you rely on each other to form a I don't remember group? us ever arguing. Interesting. Yes, so yes. So yes, obviously. Yes. Yeah. And we never talk about those days. We have never once talked about those days. 
do you consider yourself, your relationship with your father to have been a good one? Do you consider your relationship with your mother to have been a good one? Do you feel that there was a pull with one more than the other? Obviously, people are closer to their mother, naturally. Mm -hmm. That's the order of things. Right. And I think my father had issues. You know, God bless their soul. Both of them have passed away. But I think my father was a good person who did not know how to deal with his emotions Mm -hmm. and how to give love. Mm -hmm. And some people are like that. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to give love. Mm -hmm. They have it, but they don't know how to give it. Because maybe they weren't taught to or perhaps in their yeah. own home as a child. They yeah, maybe so I've made peace with him a long right. time ago, even though we'll get to the second point. At the age of 17, he said to me, now you, we're in Canada. That's what happens here. You leave home. So leave home. Your sisters are married. It's just going to be you and me. It was in the summer. So don't come back to the house. Mm-hmm. So I thank him for that now because at 17, I was on my own. Mm literally on my own in the world, mm. naive, very naive, very, very naive. You know, Yusuf, I find it really interesting, this concept of nature versus nurture. How much of you as a person, as an individual, is formed by the fact that you are the product of your mother and your father? How much is it genetic? How much is it ingrained in you? Mm. And how much of it is nurture, your environment, your peers, your schooling, uh, the city you live in? How much of that creates you and how much is just you inherent I am who I am whatever the situation is I will react a certain way it's a good question to explore yeah I I know the one thing I did for myself is to when I found myself with a lot of hate Mm -hmm. at what at what point was that 18 19 a lot of hate hate like pure hate I decided to not have hate in my life and the hate was geared to who or what? Hate towards God. Literally. Why me? Why don't you divide it up? Why is it all me? And towards family members, you know, my father and his side of the family, mostly. And uh, I decided that, thank God, I like wise at this young age to realize I don't want to live with hate and I'm going to make peace with it. And to do that, I'm not going to remember so I decided not to carry baggage, not to remember. So I don't really remember. I don't sit and sulk. So it's selective amnesia. Yeah, I, I don't want to sulk. I don't want to be like a sore loser. This is my box of chocolates, as they yeah, say. Yeah. And I'm going to deal with it and just do the best at it. And, mm-hmm. and I'm going to dictate my life. I'm going to create my life. I'm going to say what I'm good at. I'm going to achieve what I want to do. And... Immediately, I wanted to sail around the world. Were you always a disciplined person? Because when you make these sorts of declarations to yourself, you have to then, to your own self, follow up with it. Yeah. Were you someone who was always very driven because you felt that you're you're on your own two feet? No, I was never driven. You I weren't. was very naive. Uh, you know, I grew up mm-hmm. in a way that the way I was raised is very naive. I was, Where I should have been driven about things, I was too focused about missing my mother. I see. And my situation for me to have the luxury of thinking of other things. So, no, I, I'm not, you know, I drive myself now, but mm-hmm. I wasn't driven as a young kid. How old were you when your mother passed away? Oh, she died a year after we launched Fata Feet. Oh, with really? With the slogan, Al Haya Halwa, which she taught us all her life. So she saw it. She, that was like um, uh, 12 years. And how did she become a, a more strong presence in your life as you got older, as you moved back to the region here? One of the reasons I moved back, not the trigger, but one of the reasons I moved back was to, I want, as an, as a 25-year-old, 26-year-old, I said, I want to live with my mother. I want to know what family like life is like. Mm-hmm. Literally, I said yeah, that. And yeah. I came back. And you lived with her? And I lived with her for a few years until I got married. Three years, maybe four years. How, what was that like? Did it Heaven. meet your expectations? Heaven. Really? My mother. Yeah. There's, I mean, it's, a mother can't do wrong. It's really interesting. You know that, right? Yeah, of course. It's very interesting. Because it's interesting that you didn't associate her with not being there for you. You understood that oh, it was not the case. Never. Yeah. The reason she, she did not keep us is that he would not pay alimony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Period. Well, I mean, these, these rules in Egypt and in the Middle East, I don't know about other countries, but I know that in Egypt it can be very... Very harsh, the divorce rules, the custody rules. It's um, 
you know, if she kept us, we wouldn't have gone to French school. It would have been different. Yeah. So you I would have had a different upbringing. And she suffered all her life out of making that decision. Mm. It I'm wasn't sure like an easy decision. I'm take sure the kids. She did. Absolutely. But it was never okay for her ever. No, I'm sure it wasn't. So you, uh, at at some point, you emigrated to Canada with your siblings and your father. Yeah, my father was a prisoner of war in '67. In Egypt. In Sinai. In Sinai. He was in Gaza. The Israelis came in. Yeah. And they rounded up even civilians. He was a civilian working for the United Nations, and they put them in a camp. And we didn't know anything about him. And then through the Red Cross, there was a prisoner exchange. And three months later, he showed up at the door. And immediately, he applied to Leave. Australia and Canada. And Canada came first, you know. And then I found myself in a cold February winter uh, landing in uh, Toronto. With your other, with your siblings? Yeah, all, all of you us, left with All them. of us, yeah. And you were how old at this point? You said 12? 12. 12. And you were a French speaker and an Arabic speaker at the time. No English. No English Not whatsoever. Not a word. No, hello. Yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. yeah. So you had to learn a whole new way of life. The funny thing is, it's hard to imagine. I don't know if you've been to Canada recently, but at the time I was the only immigrant in the school. Mm-hmm. It was all white Anglo-Saxon. And they would actually take me from room to room and say, look, Yusuf, he's from Egypt. He's an immigrant. Oh, wow. So they took me to a special room where this young lady... I, I remember she's very imp- always fashionably dressed, even though I was a boy. She would put me out in front of a machine with a magnetic card and say say uh, a sentence. So I would read a sentence and the card would record it magnetically and then she'd play it back so I heard myself over and over and over. Until you got the accent right, the wording right and all that. Right. Special, special class for me. For you, yeah. And three months later we moved to another area with another school and she knew I was leaving and she came to me and she said the following and I'm going to regret what I said to her for the rest of my life. Hmm? I'll tell you her name and you'll know what she said. Her name was Miss Finkelstein. Mm-hmm. She said to me, I'm sorry that you have to go. I really like you and you've developed very far. You know I'm Jewish. Does that make a difference for you? And you said yes. And I said yes. But I was a but zit. You were, I was just a were, boy. you were a boy. You didn't know any better. I was repeating the... Of course. You know, the, the propaganda you Propaganda. Heard. Yeah. So, but it's interesting that she would ask you that question. That and is interesting first, as well. I yeah. find that interesting to put that pressure on a young boy. What does it matter? What does it matter? That's not the issue. Yeah. You, you connected to with her. But it she was, liked you. It was a thing at the time. It was a know? big deal at the time. You know, the, I used to get beat up at school every day because I'm from Egypt and yeah. we lost a war and yeah. we, we had, you know, the fastest retreating army in the world. You know, all these jokes course, came out at the of time. Of course, of course. About the Egyptian army. And then, you know, we, I lived to see Sadat change all of that where the people were proud to meet an Egyptian. Of course. When we come back, we dig into Yusuf's transition to TV, a shift that led to the launch of Feta Feet and what he's learning about himself at this age. That's right after this short break. Welcome back. I'm Malak Fuad, and you're listening to what I did next with my guest, Yusuf Adib. Tell me about what happened at the age of 17. Why so, did you leave home in a, I suppose, in a, not out of choice? Yeah, it, it, it happened that in my, we were in a building, all immigrants, mm-hmm. but immigrants from where? From Scotland, Lithuania, mm-hmm. Ukraine, yeah. etc. White. In the building next door, I used to see a kid every week put on a Navy uniform. He was mm-hmm. my age, 13. Mm-hmm. And go away and come back. So I asked him, what are you doing? And he said, there's something called sea cadets. It's like Boy Scouts. But if you join, in the summer, they take you away by plane to a camp on the West Coast and you actually work on ships. Mm. So I joined. And every summer for, and I paid you money. So every summer for three years, I would go. And you enjoyed this? Oh, you loved it? It saved my life. What did you like about it? The freedom of the sea? Was that an attraction? The freedom of the freedom of being my own self and doing my own thing that I've chosen. Yeah. Uh, the fact that there was travel where, you know, you went away, you learned crafts, yes. you learned things, yes. sailing, the uniform, the discipline. Yeah. I loved it. You know, it gave me purpose. So at the age of 17, while I was at camp, my last summer camp, my father came out. He said, well, you know, your sisters are getting married. They're, the two that were left in the house that didn't get married are getting married. I didn't know at the time. They're getting married this summer. And therefore, we're in Canada. And at your age in Canada, boys go on their own. Wow. So don't come back. Wow. And had anything led to that moment? Had there been issues between you? 
no, uh, no, no. I, I was away for a month before that. But that means that okay, but uh, but there had always been issues between all of us. Yes, you know. Yes, and did he remarry? Was was there a reason for him wanting to be alone at home? I don't know. I didn't ask him, but he didn't marry. He, he did didn't not marry. marry. Okay, no. okay. Well, maybe he was doing what he thought was best in terms of the new society you were in. Maybe that was his way of understanding his surroundings. I'm not. I'm not justifying it. I'm just trying to put myself in his shoes. Why would he do that? I, I don't know his reasons, but I think it's the most wonderful thing that he did to me. <laughs> it set you on your course. Yeah, it freed yeah, me. Yeah. It freed me to decide. Immediately, I was in shock. And the next thought after being in shock was, oh, now I can do whatever I want. Out of the things we've spoken of so far, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'll just go back a, a moment. Yeah. Which of those would you consider pivots? I mean, obviously, your, your, your parents' divorce changed the entire course of your of your childhood. Would you then consider going to Canada a pivot after that, leaving the house after that at 17, another pivot? Yeah. These are all pivots in your life. Yeah, and the next one is choosing film. So I attended two years of fine arts in Victoria on the West Coast. Yeah. So and fine arts is painting, drawing. You're all exposed of it. to all of it. Yeah. Sculpture, painting, silk screen. And then I, th and film. And I said, I got enough of this. I need film focus. So I went to two years. In, back in Toronto at Ryerson studying film. And I didn't finish my degree because while I was at film school, I was working with the National Film Board as an editor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And graduates would come to me looking for work. Mm. And it was a struggle. It was getting more expensive every year because you have to make bigger films. Um, and I was working like midnight shifts, crazy days, good days. Yeah. So I didn't continue. So you were learning on the job. Yeah. And so after that, you carried on working um, in Canada. Is that right? Briefly. Yeah. And then one day, I saw a sign. Two things happened in my life that brought me back, at this parallel to each other. One is I started reading the Alexandria Quartet, <laughs> right? And I thought, I want to be there. I Did it trigger in your mind a familiarity? Totally. Totally. Totally, but maybe in a romantic yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I think of all my siblings, because I was the youngest, I did not see the the negative side of coming back. Yeah. I was more of a romantic image of Egypt for me. And so I was reading that. And at the same time, I saw a sign, premiere of an Egyptian film at the university, The Night of Counting the Years, mm -hmm. an odd name for the mummy. The It's called The Mummy, I think. Mm -hmm. Shadi Abdus Salam. Yes. So I went to see it and I thought, oh... I really don't understand anything of what he's talking about, but I love the visuals. I love the that it's sober. There's a sobriety to that film. So b because of these two, I decided to, I thought I'm going to go back and live with my mother. And you're 25 at this point. 24, 25. 24, yeah. 25. So really, you, you didn't have much of a working life in Canada. No, no, Not no. Not really. No, no. This is the funny story. Mm -hmm. I, I'm reading the Alexander Quartet. Mm. And I'm working as a second sound editor on a series called The Amateur Naturalist by Gerald Durrell, Lawrence's the brother, brother. The brother, yeah. So every day I'm seeing him in the editing room and I'm getting his beers because he's always drinking a light Hawaiian. And then I go home and read the yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. But it's funny. Whenever I, what, the interviews I've heard with you and when I've spoken with you the, before today, there, I always feel that there's a nostalgia about you for Alexandria. And I don't know if it's because it's fundamentally home. Um, I know you have a conflicted relationship with the city, but I feel that it's always infusing your conversation somewhere along the line. Alexandria comes through. Yeah. And the reason I pick up on it is because my father was like that. So he was always talking about Alexandria, but the, but the beautiful side of Alexandria, not what it is today. So there's a nostalgia there, you know? Yeah, I have memories in yeah. Alexandria, you know, and it was a, it's a different Alexandria. Yeah. I don't have a problem with Alexandria. I think Alexandria has a problem with itself. I think it certainly does. When you grow up, when your bus driver is, is Greek, the school bus driver is Greek. Can you imagine? Yeah. You go to Delice for the baba, my favorite mm -hmm. dessert, because that's where my mother took us. And there's an Italian three-piece band playing in the corner jazz. This was Alexandria. Yeah. But this is almost like it's frozen in time and, and certain people have these memories. And I would see the all of this through the eyes of my father and we would tour and we would look around at certain things that in his mind were landmarks. But what I would see 
as someone in reality looking at the city with a completely different picture. Mm. It's a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> it's a disaster. Yeah. But he would look past it almost, you know? Yeah. It's I interesting. St- I stopped going because of yeah, we did the too. shock of what, yeah. what, it, what it is now. It couldn't, yeah. I think it was just a very special period that were very multinational, exactly. very mixed, very exactly. open. Yeah. So going back to your career, um, y- you started working in film in Egypt, but you were disappointed by the industry here. It was horrible. Wh- what, when I came. When, when you I were came. working here, yeah. I don't know the word. It's like a lot of complex people were working at the time in film. Um, films were done cheaply. Not much. Was it like a churning out of just product? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and stars controlled <clears throat> more than today, controlled what the output. So I gravitated towards advertising. Mm-hmm. I went to Kuwait to do a couple of commercials with another company. Mm-hmm. And I did them in India. And it's funny, at the time, India was just opening up. I don't know if you know, but India was close to anything imported for 20 years. So because of that, there was no restaurants, fast food restaurants. There was no brands. So I had to create everything. I remember at one point, we wanted to do a KFC series of commercials for KFC. So they built a restaurant for me, hmm. literally wow. from wow. pictures. Wow. So, um, so I enjoyed working there. I made good friends to this day. I was just talking to one of them yesterday. What do you want? Do you want animation? But the original idea of going to India was that it was more cost effective. Was that the original idea of working there? I didn't know anyone in the (laughs) industry in Egypt and I didn't know anyone in India. So Mm -hmm. I decided to go to India because I felt it was a more professional, advanced uh, industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, To this day, I would work in India more than I would work anywhere else to produce something. So your next career move was NBC. After that? Then I got the call from NBC to be their head of production and programming. But that's a that's quite a transition from doing in-house ads for a very large company, granted, yeah. to then producing uh, content, like major change. Major change to be at the top mm-hmm. network. Exactly. Managing um, millions of dollars worth of budget. Mm-hmm. What did you like of it, about it? What made you do that? What made you t- take that leap from... The Americana, challenge. The, the challenge. challenge. The challenge. Yeah, of course, the of challenge. Course. It's always the challenge with you. It's a challenge. Also, NBC, you know, you're going to the top network. So after that, you were three three years at NBC, and you, you moved on because, what, you felt that you were ready for another challenge, or? I developed ulcers. Wow. I got tired of phone calls <laughs> at three in the morning. Right? It's a package deal. You know, you're getting that, that sure. big job, but you also... Mm. So I left and someone asked me what I wanted to do next. And I said, Food Network. Where did that come from? So let's let's unpack Fetafit's origins a little bit. Uh, well, I spent, you know, I spent nine, ten years doing food commercials. Yes. And, you know, when you do food commercials, you're looking into a slice of pizza for two days and you're seeing how the how to raise it, you build a mechanism to raise it with the cheese. You know, you do all these things where you're the focused styling, on food. The styling of food. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you realize that food is harmless. When you work with food in media, it's a nice thing. It's not like anything else. It's not like... It's not going to talk back to you. <laughs> no, no I, meant, I meant it's not like I'm going to do a series about divorce or about some death. Oh, or I about, see. That could impact people negatively. Food is just... Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. So... It's comfort. It's comfort. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's, yeah. it's what we do three times a day for all our lives and never get bored, you know. Mm-hmm or people like me, more than three times a day. (laughs) And I had seen how all the networks in the Middle East put food as filler in the middle of the day. And I had seen Food Network in the U.S. I didn't invent the wheel. So I decided that we need an Arabic food network. What if we do an Arabic food network? And that's how the idea came about. I know that at some stage you were importing... European and American shows yeah, yeah. as well, but we, you were also producing lo, uh, original content. This is how it started. Yes. We came up with a name mm-hmm. and a logo and a slogan and a mascot, mm-hmm. the ant, mm-hmm. small ant, mm-hmm. Antar. Smallest thing is small Antar. <laughs> and then, exactly, and then that's... That's the, that's the reaction you want. Yes. <laughs> so I called on Food Network to answer your question, flew to New York, Signed a deal with them, an output deal to get 400 hours per year from them. This was at the beginning of the of Fetafit. Before we launched. Right. So we launched with all Western content from Food Network, subtitled, mm-hmm. unedited. I did not remove alcohol. Whenever wine was added, I just wrote, use um, grape vinegar. Mm-hmm. 
I thought the audience is smart. Or nothing at all. No one ever complained. Yeah. I was scared mm. people would complain. No one ever complained. People are smart. And then we started to produce our own content by identifying chefs, you know, that I felt I could sort of make work. Yeah. And then over time, the balance became more Arabic mm -hmm. than Western. And then you would presumably have to find distributors for the channel. Would it be, was it part of the NBC uh, umbrella? No, no. At it the was... time, at the time, it was just you go on a satellite. Yeah. And, and people, you find it. And people tune it for free. Mm. Right, know? right. The okay. free-to-air day. Yeah. But I did something nice. I was shooting in HD from day one. This is what I wanted to ask you. You mentioned this in one of your interviews. Knowing that food needs to look HD, so we would have at least the library would be HD for the day when we had enough money to convert to HD. That's an extremely... Um, it's a lot, it, it, it's, you came to that question with a lot of foresight, knowing that eventually that would be required. Was that an additional investment for you that you had to... No, I, we were lucky. The time that we were launching Fetafid, this camera came out called the Canon 5D that became standard. Right. That allowed you for small money to shoot high definition with cinematic lenses. So it wasn't a huge shift in it how you were cheaper. working. It was cheaper. I see. It was actually cheaper than normal television mm -hmm. cameras, mm -hmm. yeah. And I know you, the, the slogan of the, of the channel is El Haya Halwa from uh, saying that your mother uh, used to tell you. It's a very nice thing to have incorporated this in your true baby. I mean, Fatafit is very much your idea, your, your, your initiative. Um, I think it's, tell me a little bit about why, why that came to you as the, a good slogan for Fatafit. At the time, you're talking 2005, 2006, all you saw in the news was Every day, mm -hmm. 70 people died in an explosion in Baghdad or somewhere else, in Tafada, etc. And as a father of young children at the time, I felt, looking at the scope of networks or you know media exposure, it was still television at the time. It was TV sitting on the couch with the family. There was no yes. other way. It was communal. So I thought, I want to create an oasis mm -hmm. of normalcy. All I wanted was something normal. Mm. In my eyes, what could be normal, which doesn't have screaming, doesn't have people eating, spitting food out of their mouth, which I don't know why it's become like what Arabs do in media. Uh, I didn't want divorce. I didn't want religion. I didn't want politics. I didn't want any of those. I just wanted food. And so therefore, Haya Halwa, was an invitation to enjoy life. And we sang it. We sang it every 10 minutes at the jingle. And it's my pride that a lot of kids grew up hearing it. You know, I get a lot of messages from either kids who have grown up with it telling me, you know, you've, you, because of you, we entered the kitchen and we became, or parents, mothers who wrote to us saying, you saved my marriage by showing me how to be creative how in the kitchen. Yeah. And a lot of guys would watch it at night. They would, you know, confess to me. When we want to relax at night, we put it on. Uh, so I just wanted to project normalcy. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's all. Just mm -hmm. something normal. What I feel normal. Yeah. And what do you think the legacy of Fatafit is today? Oh, when I look at Instagram and see a, a million young people putting recipes on Instagram, um, I say we started that. Because at the time, chefs were wearing a uniform, cooking in real time, and we sort of opened it up to mm -hmm, everyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You also say in one of your interviews that the sale of Feta Feet was traumatic. Why is that? Because it was my baby. Mm -hmm. Because the people buying it, I felt, did not know. You know, they asked me, well, you can stay, but don't do anything. Mm. They wanted you to stay on with the channel. Yeah, but that's what they said. But yeah. I knew that that's just short term. Mm -hmm. They didn't get that the soul of the channel is me and my team, the senior team. Mm -hmm. We're all creative people. We're not business people. They didn't get that. They didn't get that it takes a lot of detail, minute by minute detail, like anal detail to make the make sure the recipes are tested, to make sure the visuals are so clean. They removed the slogan. They removed the ant, you know, the, the, the soul of the mm -hmm. channel, mm -hmm. and, and they encrypted it. So it was not available to everyone. It's not, it hasn't been since, for, you know, people think I encrypted it. So it's it. a much more limited audience. What is it like now as a channel? I don't is watch it. Is it anything like what you created? Since I sold it, I haven't watched haven't. a minute of it. And that's a conscious. Decision. But I know people who work yeah. there, the chefs that I knew, and they tell me it's just horrible. 
I want to end with one question. So you told me the other day when we chatted that you're in therapy now. Yes. That it was a new thing that you were, you had had begun yeah. exploring. Um, what made you start going down that path? I think when we spoke, you had only been doing it for a month. Yeah. How is it going? What was your motivation for doing, for going to seek help yeah. for whatever you went to seek help for? Um, and and ha has it helped? Yes. The uh, mm -hmm. last question, yes, mm -hmm. it has helped. Mm -hmm. I had, um, the reason I started seeing a psychologist, and at the time I didn't know the difference between the psychologist and the psychiatrist, and my daughter explained it to me, and then she found one for me, and the reason was lack of sleep. I don't sleep enough, so therefore I'm not resting enough, therefore I'm putting on weight, therefore I don't remember things. It's like a... It's a cycle. It's a cycle, yeah. So I, um, I hesitantly, and I was scared, you know, and um, I, I, the experience has been very interesting in the sense that they don't really do anything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I shouldn't say it this way. They don't do much, but they get you to talk. And therefore, when you talk, you kind of go into self-reflective and you reevaluate things in your life. But the psychologist has also helped me tremendously as I write my memoir. In what way? Because I hadn't been, I don't spend time thinking about, like I told you about memory, I don't spend time thinking of my childhood. So as I write my memoir, and, I, and, you, and you mentioned formative years, and that happens to be what I call the first chapter, my formative years. Um, so as I explore, and, I, and you know, when you write, you want to dig deep and, and talk about details, right? Mm -hmm. So having a, the psychologist sessions and talking to her has sort of removed the dust from, yeah. from, from the history and helped You've me. You've had to think through it yeah, again. Yeah, and it's, what's it been like? Every time I have a session, I feel unhinged afterwards for a day or two. But you also feel a bit of relief, maybe? That you've unloaded something? I, I don't know yet. Yeah. Really, it's, um, to be honest, I don't know yet. I All I feel is unhinged. And sometimes I feel, am I doing the right thing by opening up like that? I was okay. You know, I was I was more okay, more put together before I started this, but... You brought it on to yourself by by opening up, but but it's helping me in my writing, so I'm not uh, mm -hmm. I'm not regretting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that answer somehow? Yeah, it answers question? it very well. Um, so you, you're happy you did it. Oh yeah. Yeah, and do your family notice a difference? No, not yet. Not yet. It's no. too soon, maybe. I think they noticed me being more assertive about myself. Being selfish with yourself. Not even selfish. No. He, here's the thing. I have, you know, some people I know on Instagram or social media, they they say sometimes, I love myself. <laughs> okay? Mm. I have trouble with that. Yeah. On many levels, I have trouble with that. I have trouble saying it about myself. I have trouble with anyone saying it. So I was exploring that with my psychologist, and then I realized that I don't give myself enough rights or space. So, for example, one of the benefits of psychology, I'm going to do something, and my daughter will call me and say, I'm going to the mall. Do you want to meet up for coffee? Normally, the normal Yusuf would say, would drop everything and say yes. The, the, new, the new Yusuf. The new Yusuf will say, sorry, I'm going to the gym because yeah. I've already yeah, planned it yeah, that way. Yeah. So it's kind of liking myself and being comfortable with myself more than loving myself. But it's Respecting myself. It's interesting because I'm sure that uh, in work, there is assertive Yusuf. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, very, very. But not on the home front or in the no, personal the, the, space. The, on the contrary, on the opposite contrary. Like at work, it's like we're on a mission. We need to get it done. At home, it's more uh, making sure everybody's comfortable, everybody's happy. Uh, yeah. It's super interesting. Uh, the, the the way we compartmentalize things in our mind. Yeah. And how we, we are a certain way in a certain space. And we're different yeah. elsewhere. It's fascinating. I was I was meeting one of one of the chefs that that you know a, a few of them have become major celebrities, yeah. like Orfeli, um, who does Aleppo cuisine, is just voted as the number six restaurant in the Middle East. He's only been open nine months. It literally it's, it's an special. experience. It's an experience. Yeah. Why? What's what is it? What does he do that? Because so these are guys that spent years studying the palate and studying. Mm -hmm what things go together and they'll go get some rare rare spice from Uganda with a Japanese mishal Like fail. El Bouli, similar. Well, the Bouli is for them as their god. And they've been to these restaurants to work in the kitchen, you know, and yeah. and the end result is yeah. this. So the reason I mention is because two days ago, 
about how we deal with different situations differently. I was with another chef from Lebanon that I've wanted to meet for a long time, and we were all there. And Orfali Muhammad was talking about Fatafid days, and he said, he said, he was pointing at me, and he said, I learned from this guy that there's no room for failure. Hmm. You know, that we have to do our more than our best, and we just think, don't think of failure. Just Because at Fatafit, when we worked, we didn't look at the competition. We didn't look at our ratings. We just, like, dug in, pretended nobody else was there. And, uh, yeah, so the mindset at work, I'm sure for all of us, mm-hmm. is different from mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at home. So I want to ask you two final questions. Yeah. And I just thought of them now as you were speaking. What does failure look like to you? Entropy. Entropy, which means basically um, sort of lethargy, no movement. Uh, it, yeah, it means that, and it means entropy, meaning like, um, like, well, like, I'm sure it's the same for you. When I write or when I paint or when I'm doing things, the pain goes away. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, the pain mm-hmm, in my mm-hmm, body, the pain mm-hmm, in my life. I, mm-hmm. you know, by, it's by being creative or by producing, by doing things. So entropy is unable, being unable to do that. So by doing, you are happy. You're alive. You're alive. Yeah. Okay, what does, and is that the case in work and personal for you? Or you, you is know, it just a general? That's, that's a very good point. That's a difficult one. No, I mean, it is difficult, but it's a, it's a timely question because at my age, it's that time where you're thinking, how many more days left have I got like working mm-hmm. professionally? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what do I pivot to yes, in my life? Exactly. So, so the writing is helping me saying, okay, even if I'm like at home for the rest of my life, yeah. I have something to do all day that gives me pleasure, that gives me purpose. And what does success look like to you? Adding value to others, really, purely. Mm-hmm. Adding value to others. I, it used to mean achieving things for myself. I've done that very early. For years now, it's been just helping others have better lives or deal with life in a better way. If I can... If I'm able to do that, I feel blessed. Thank you for listening today. This episode of What I Did Next was brought to you by ANT Media with me, Malak Fuad, and is co-produced by Shirag Desai. Please remember to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for updates on the show. Just search for What I Did Next. You can help our show to grow by leaving us a positive review in your favorite podcast player. Join us in two weeks' time where Shirag and I recap the highlights of the season and look briefly ahead to season four. We hope you can join us then.